You're very, you're very, very welcome. Um, I will let you give you stage. If you can just introduce yourself, tell them who you are, Sorry. and uh, then you've got the there we stage go. is yours. So thank welcome. you very much, Joe. Thank you, and uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Dimitri Zengelis. Um, now, I'm an economist at the London School of Economics. I'm a macroeconomist by background, but uh, my focus uh, for the last six or so years since being one of the authors of something called the Stern Review on the economics of climate change is the economics of climate change, resource sustainability, uh, and sustainable growth. And of course, increasingly, uh, I have started looking at cities. I work with my colleagues at LSE Cities, uh, looking at the uh, issue of resource-efficient, sustainable, uh, dare I call it green uh, cities, I agree uh, with much of what Joe said about the term green, incidentally. And one of the cities we look at, actually, uh, one of our partner cities is Copenhagen. So uh, it's as much of a pleasure, if not more, uh, than, uh, uh, than usual pleasure to be here uh, in that context. It's always a great city uh, to be in. This um, first slide, so I'm going to give a little presentation, but I'm not going to go through it in detail. You can always sort of come to me or take it away uh, with all the sort of um, full uh, details uh, later on. I'm just going to sort of sketch what the kind of broad outlines are. So. Uh, in keeping with that, I start with what is ultimately a sketch. It doesn't even have an x-axis. But these are sort of a very beautiful chart uh, that illustrates a whole range of resource uses across the world, which uh, pose the nature of the global challenge. Uh, and in this sense, um, I'm starting with the notion that cities are, to some extent, part of the problem in terms of providing a main source of global demand for increasingly scarce resources, simply by virtue of the numbers. Cities are home to half the world's 7 billion population. Uh, they're responsible for about three quarters of the world's GDP, but they're also responsible for a similar proportion of uh, resource use and greenhouse gas emissions. By the middle of the century, as Joe already hinted, that will be uh, three quarters of the world's population and an even greater uh, size of uh, emissions and uh, resource use by uh, all likelihood. Um, so cities, as I say, are part of the problem, but the important element to take home is that actually cities are clearly part of the solution as well. And hopefully, they are a bigger part of the solution than they are uh, a part of the problem. Why do I say that? Well, um, firstly, because if you think about cities as an entity, the very reason you have cities is to generate resource efficiency, right? You have cities in order to get people together so that you can bring in and distribute uh, raw materials, resources, goods and services, take out waste or uh, recycle waste, increasingly as we would like to see, and export goods and services. But it's more than just this sort of static efficiency idea, which is the genesis of cities. It's why they're often found on ports or on rivers and so on. They try to generate efficient use and distribution of scarce resources. But it's about human resources as well. It's about ideas and innovation. The only way we're going to see sustainable growth and global poverty reduction, which is a worthy aim, is if we grow more intelligently. Now, the good news is that what drives growth in advanced economies is not throwing more people or more capital or more resources at output. It's the intelligence with which you use output. It's what economists call total factor productivity. Uh, and that is essentially how smartly we use things. And the good news is, unlike every other resource which is subject to diminishing returns and subject to uh, scarcity, knowledge is not subject to diminishing returns. It's not uh, party to the second law of thermodynamics. In fact, it's the other way around. Knowledge builds on knowledge. It actually is subject to increasing returns. It's very difficult to unlearn things unless you start burning libraries and uh, uh, you know, disestablishing the internet. So we tend to uh, generate increasing returns. And that in a sense, is the goose that could possibly lay the golden egg in terms of allowing us to grow sustainably. By the way, I won't have time to finish this whole presentation, so apologies if I'm talking too fast. And if I go on too long, please give me a sort of polite, subtle sign, like kind of booing or throwing stuff at me or hissing, and I, and I will stop. Um, but the essential point here is that cities have this kind of unique cocktail, this sort of this blend of specialization and diversity that generates innovation and that generates the knowledge growth. And I could give you many examples of key innovations that uh, are derived from uh, urban uh, from urban environments. So, uh, top of the sort of question on co-benefits of urban uh, growth and resource-efficient growth is innovation. Uh, increased efficiency I've also touched upon. There are other benefits, of 
of course, to living more sustainable lifestyle, cleaner, quieter, uh, less congested cities, more livable cities, which of course then attracts high-skilled, high-end uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, and high-technology firms, as we've seen uh, in this city, perhaps more than, than anywhere else. Um, and of course, cities have governance mechanisms that are very important. In many senses, um, cities, uh, are policy makers at the urban level are actually closer, both physically but also culturally, to their uh, populations and to their citizens than are national governments. And surveys tend to suggest that urban populations, they tend to be a bit more progressive, they put a higher premium on sustainability, provided there is a clear uh, and properly understood mandate. And that, again, is something that I think Copenhagen offers a sort of shining, Beacon. But the essential uh, uh, ingredient, if you like, the defining characteristic of cities, which I think is really important, is the degree of uh, lock in you get. And this is why delay is costly. If you make the wrong decision at the urban level, you can really screw up. Um, you have cities across the world that are similar population sizes, similar levels of uh, income and prosperity, but vastly different resource use. So if you take greenhouse gas emissions as a proxy for resource use, you look at Copenhagen or Helsinki or Amsterdam or Barcelona, or even London and Paris, um, you get very different emissions per head than you would in Phoenix, in Atlanta, in Minneapolis. Um, orders of magnitude different. And they're similar income levels. Why? Because the latter camp have tended to lock into a sprawling suburban car use model whereas the former have gone for a more dense public transport use model. And once you lock in, it's very difficult to move, right? One of the notions of lock in, I mean, I, I saw someone the other day here who was wearing a London Transport Mind the Gap t-shirt. If you've been to London, you'll know that these t-shirts come from the fact that Bank Station is built in a curve, so the train carriages, of course, don't meet with the platform properly. There's a gap. You have an announcement that goes Mind the Gap. Why do you have that? Because the Victorians who built the underground had to follow the roads, because if they didn't follow the roads, they'd have to pay rent to private owners. And who established the roads? Well, the Romans did 2,000 years ago. So there's someone in Copenhagen wearing a t-shirt saying, mind the gap, all down to the decisions made by a sort of centurion 2,000 years ago. I mean, it's an example of the kind, once you lock into an urban set, it's very difficult to move out. It's very expensive now to, for Atlanta to become resource efficient. How do you do that when you've got highways, sprawling suburbs, and so on? Um, so you know, the infrastructure you lock into, you kind of stuck with. So those kinds of decisions are massively important, in particular in countries which are still urbanizing at a rapid rate in China, in India. But it's not just mortar and concrete and bricks, it's also behavioral mindsets. And in fact, the two go together. You walk around Copenhagen, everybody cycles, everybody's on a bike. You ask people here, why do you all cycle? Well, because the infrastructure is really friendly to cyclists. Why have you got really friendly cycling infrastructure? Well, obviously, because everybody cycles. <laughs> Um, well, it doesn't matter how you start that circle. The point is, once you lock into that kind of environment, it, both in terms of physical infrastructure and mindsets, it's very difficult to move. And that's the kind of path dependency that cities drive uh, that is important to lock into correctly. Here's an example of this picture, graphically illustrates of locking in incorrectly to the kind of environment that we face. This is. This comes from um, Karl Zernig's Death of Sprawl, and it shows this woman here is clearly not happy with the state of affairs, and those state of affairs have something to do with the state of what used to be her house. Uh, this is a community called Victuville, 100 miles away from uh, Los Angeles. It's a sprawling subject, uh, suburb, entirely new built, but based on car use. So if you want to go to the local schools, local shops, local uh, 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 retail outlets, you have to drive substantial, often tens of miles, in order to get to work and services. That was viable at a time when the price of gas, as they call it in America, was $2 to the gallon. Um, as soon as the stuff that was carried in these things here doubled and tripled in price, so the price at the pumps rose to, to, to $4 in 2008, um, as soon as that happened, these communities became unviable. People didn't want to live there. The people that were there couldn't sell their houses. The mortgage companies moved in on foreclosure. The mortgage companies couldn't even sell the houses. In the end, this entire new build housing stock was just demolished over the space of two years. It's a sign of the unsustainability of building communi communities that are not resource efficient. This happened over a short-term price spike, but we know that the prices of most resources have started to rise over the last 10 years. In fact, over the last 10 years, the increase of most 
basic resource price has been sufficient to wipe out the reduction we saw over the entire 20th century. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. You don't have to look beyond the degree of development in India and China and the pressure that's put on finite resources, even as we excavate and find new sources for these resources, which may uh, you know, break the trend increase in that price. But that price increase is almost certain to continue to, to rise if we're to see the kinds of growth in consumption that we would like to see. Um, there are urban leaders uh, who have shown the way. I've mentioned already that cities of similar levels of prosperity can have very radically different levels of uh, resource intensity, and I'll leave it to you to decide whether, and it's a matter of subjective taste, and we all have our opinions, but you know whether Copenhagen and Barcelona and Amsterdam are, uh, are more livable cities than, than, than Atlanta and Phoenix, but there's certainly similar levels of income per capita. Um, efficient cities, as you all know here, they have to be smart, so the role of technology in using resources is going to be crucial. Cities that that think, that adapt, that evolve, that learn to optimize their use of resources, of food, of energy, of health, of communications, and the share of knowledge through smart grids, smart healthcare, smart public safety, and smart buildings are the ones that are going to be in a better position to work efficiently as tightly integrated systems, not just of things, but also uh, of uh, human beings. And of course, policy is going to play a crucial part in ensuring that transition, not just pricing the externalities, uh, greenhouse gases, but other resources that are overused, but bringing forward technology through appropriate support of, of uh, research and development, overcoming information barriers, and as I said earlier, changing behaviors, understanding uh, the notion of responsible behaviors across all society. So it's beyond just sticks and carrots. It's about the conception of the good life. Again, something that uh, 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 people could learn substantially from uh, the citizens of Copenhagen. So uh, to, to sum up, the choices we make today at the urban level on transport, on infrastructure, on buildings uh, will determine whether we can uh, grow rapidly, alleviate poverty over the coming centuries, determine the technology, the institutions and the infrastructure we lock into, and whether we can square the circle of resource efficiency and climate change and manage the benefits, because as Ban Ki-moon said uh, yesterday, this is a huge opportunity opportunity. But how we manage that opportunity depends on the actions we take today, the actions we take at the urban level. Thank you very much. I, I, I felt I was breathing for you the whole of that presentation. <laughs> A um, couple of quick questions. It's, a, it's an above average intelligence. Yeah, 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 no, no, that was, so I kind of, you know, it was like, God, that was great. It was fantastic. I hope you took all that in. Um, and I'm sure the presentation is available. And uh, yes. if you want it, uh, you can have it. But a um, couple of things. Give us a couple of examples of cities you think, you know, one in the developed world, one in the developing world, where you think, wow, they have really got, and don't mention Copenhagen, for God's sake. Uh -huh. Enough about Oops, Copenhagen. It's gone. But, you know, countries well, there, you think there was are, a list cities, cities you think are really good, and a couple of cities you think are, like just haven't got the, have lost the plot. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I couldn't list any that have lost the plot. Um, you know, because even the Phoenixes and the Arizonas of this world are thinking of ways, given that they've locked into a structure that's very difficult uh, to change. Uh, you know, there are opportunities. Maybe have bus lanes on highways. Maybe have uh, regionally uh, distributed energy sources, which aren't part of the grid, and so on. So there are there are different solutions to different you know established urban environments. But there are examples, and there is a list, both in the one I flashed very briefly, but also as an annex, of different approaches adopted at different cities across the world. So, um, you know, we've got certain Scandinavian cities we, we know about. Uh, we've got examples from New York and London. Uh, different kinds of examples, but Mayor Bloomberg in New York, congestion charging an example in London. We have Kirichiba uh, in Brazil. We have Bogota with bus rapid trans transit, and so on and so forth. But I will say this, the most successful cities are the ones who don't just implement policies that focus just on transport, or just on green roofs, or just on solar panels here and there. But they're the ones that put out a signal to the private sector that says we are looking for an integrated solution. And, and you know, I won't mention Copenhagen, but you can you can think of somewhere close to home that might uh, you know f where this might apply. Uh, well, like which, Copenhagen, you mean? Well, like Copenhagen, <laughs> for God, example. That's amazing. <laughs> funny, funny you said it. Um, but uh, you know where. 
it's very clear that there is a coherent approach to this, and that's actually what the private sector needs, because ultimately it's the private sector that's going to provide the innovation. It needs a very clear public sector signal, and a public sector signal requires a sense of common understanding of the problem and the, the, the politicians being held accountable for delivering in this area in a mandate that is commonly understood and widely supported. And that's that sort of squaring the circle of governments, uh, political support, and private investment that, that you know, certain cities manage to deliver very successfully and others don't. So the ones that aren't moving don't move because they don't see political advantage in going clean. Okay. Um, and they don't see competitive advantage in going clean. Why should we move if this and that city isn't moving? It's going to cost us more heating bills. It's going to mean I'm going to have to kind of pay more for my gas. Why okay, um, and one other very, very, very brief thing, got this poster here saying clean tech is all about collaborating, so let's mind each other's business. Um, but that's also true of cities. So just tell us a little bit, just for a minute or so, about what is going on in terms of collaboration amongst, you know, you've got the C40 cities about, what, you know, is that really taking off and what difference will that make? I think, I mean, so somebody talked about bottom up and top down. I mean, you have these organizations now, um, you know, C40, ICLE and others, uh, that are learning. I mean, there are no two cities that are alike. Right? Every city is idiosyncratic. There's no one policy mix you can take off the peg that applies to all cities. But they have common properties. There are similarities across cities. And there's a lot that cities can and do learn from each other. And I think having these organizations which are kind of neither top down or bottom up, because you need both, right? Um, if you leave it just to top down without any international agreement, it's much easier uh, for people to say, well, you know, why should we act if someone else isn't acting? Whereas if everybody's moving with the collective grain, uh, it's it's easier to sell politically, if nothing else. But ultimately, the real action is going to happen bottom up. So if you can learn, share from good example, uh, learn from the experiences, and also you know, not just good, but also some of the sort of challenges from other cities, that cumulative knowledge helps you apply uh, the experience of other cities more effectively in your own city. And ultimately, cities have common properties of the kind that I mentioned at the beginning to do with uh, delivering, distributing goods and services amongst citizens, but also making cities successful, innovative, uh, and livable. Great. Well, I'm afraid we've got to move on, but if we can all just thank Dimitri. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.